All right, Revelation chapter 17. Uh, let's begin here. Let's read 1 through 6. Who will grab that for us? Ron. And one of the seven angels who had seven bulls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the fullness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and of all the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. All right, so question number one, I had asked, who is the great harlot and what are some characteristics we can learn from the description given? So read down through that. What jumps out at you? Who is this? What is this? What's that? Terrible. Okay, terrible. It, it's an ugly, nasty scene. Description. When you think of harlot, what do you think of? Sold yourself. What's that? Sold yourself to something else. Sold yourself to something else? Okay, that's a good description. Anything else? Unclean. Unclean, unclean immoral, um, disregarding God and His will and corrupting others as it talks about this idea of the fornication inhabitants of earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication the kings committed fornication with her so there's this corrupting influence that is associated with her so what or who might this be as you read on down through chapter 17 get into 18 you it really is just going over this idea again and again. Okay, it is Babylon, but what is who is Babylon? Okay. Now the Roman Empire throughout this has there there's different pictures for different aspects of the empire, different elements within the within the empire. So if you've got the, the beast of the earth that we talked about, or the beast of the sea that we talked about, representing the emperors or a specific emperor, you've got the beast of the earth representing the false religious worship of the emperor, the emperor cult. If you think about a harlot and things talked about here, what aspect of Rome would that be? It's the city of Rome, the actual city. Yeah. Okay, it definitely fits that city. Was there something else? The government. Well, there's the government would be fold within this. The church in Rome, perhaps. Uh, not particularly the church, but it's talking about that immoral culture that is there in Rome. Uh, the things that are focused on the materialism the sensualism, all those kinds of things, because we get down into chapter 18, you'll see why they get upset at the fall of Babylon, the, the defeat of this harlot. Jeff? Well, the mention, the mention of the purple, to me, indicates that the purple buildings, the power of the main families. Okay. Okay, all right, so you see her here sitting on the many waters, which is explained as what? He explained it. Remember, you know, this is one of the interesting places in Revelation because he 
he gets this image, he sees this thing, and then the angel comes along and says, let me tell you what this is. And he gives the explanation of it, which we'll talk about in a minute. But so what are those nations? What? Okay, see how many watch its nations. Let's talk about people um, as he describes it later. So these kings committed fornication with her. They got in bed with her. Heavens to the earth made intoxicate or made drunk with her intoxication. Um, the allurement was so great that they imbibed in it and it affected their judgment. It, they set aside what was right because of this. So she rides this beast. What does this beast sound like when it gets down into the description? Seven heads, ten horns, all those kinds of things. Yeah, it sounds like the beast of the sea. So you, you see how he, he's really just giving us the, the idea that this immoral culture sits on Rome or imperial Rome or the government of Rome. The government of Rome supports it. It, it rides it. They, they're symbiotic, if you will, in their relationship. Um, purple, as Joe mentioned, luxury and wealth being associated with her. Scarlet would be what? She's got purple and scarlet. Those are expensive colors. Right expensive? It, yeah, I mean, we weren't allowed to wear them. Okay, beyond the wealth, what would scarlet represent? Immorality. Though your sins be as scarlet, right? So there, there's the, the luxury, the wealth, the opulence, if you will, as Joe's referring to, and scarlet being the, the immorality, the sin that is associated with it. What about this cup that she's holding? What kind of cup is that? Verse 4. Anybody? Precious stones. Gold and precious stones, which would typically be what? At least in the Old Testament, thinking back to Babylon, we usually only saw that with kings. Okay. So this this is a cup that from the, its appearance it looks very valuable, very great, very precious, maybe desirable to have, associated perhaps with royalty, things like that. But what's in the cup? Abomination. The cup looks good, like, oh, I would like to use that cup. But look what's in it. It's filth. You know, that's, that's the nature of immorality in a culture. Oh, it looks so good. It looks so good and enticing. And I, I want that. I want that. But then when you partake of it, it's abominations. It's filth. It's poison is the idea. That's what's in her cup. And... What is her state? She's drunk. Drunk. On what? Blood of the saints. Blood of the saints. So you can't mistake who this is. It's hot, you know, mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots, abominations of the earth. This is talking about that Roman culture that is oppressing, persecuting, murdering the children of God because they do not partake of this culture. They're not a part of it. They stand opposed to it and condemn it. And so she's drunk with the blood of the saints. Now, the angel, as we say, goes on to talk about this vision and explain it, verses 7 down through 18. Let's just go ahead and read those. Revelation 17, 7 through 18. Who will grab that for us? Henry? Then the angel said to me, Why did you mourn? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. Here is the mind which is wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings 
five to follow. One is, and the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth, and is of the seventh, in his own perdition. Ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they received authority for one hour as kings of the beast. These are of one mind and give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war for the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. And he said to me, The wonders which you saw, where the harlot sits, are people of multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her own fire. For God has put into their hearts to fulfill his purpose to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast, until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Okay. So he goes through this explanation, says, Here, here's what you're looking at, and goes through various details in there. The seven heads in particular, he says, are what there in verse 9? The seven mountains on which the woman sits. Okay. Um, the city on the seven hills, as I recall. Exactly. The city on seven hills. Uh, that's a description of Rome uh, at the time. And then he also says, but, you know, they also represent something else. This is an image. He tells us these seven heads. One, it represents mountains, but it also represents seven heads or seven uh, kings. And it talks about. You know, five have fallen, another has not yet come, and the beast is the eighth. Um, there's a lot of things you can read. People try to chase down and nail down specifically exactly who's who in this description. But that's really to miss the point of what he's making. He's describing this as a totality of the beast, if you will. You know, seven representing the complete there's an eighth, there's another. So he's not trying to say there's a specific number and here's the identity of a specific king or the ten kings. Well, who are those ten kings? Who are the ten horns? Let's, let's figure out what nation, what city state they're over and, and all those kinds of things. He's just trying to give this overall idea of here's the nature of that beast with the harlot associated with the harlot. And then here's what's going to be the outcome of that beast and what will happen with him and why it's going to happen with that beast. So in verse 14, what does he say? Here's, here's what's coming out. Okay, so he's talking about the seven heads, talking about the ten kings, they're going to make war with the lamb, but what will happen? Lamb will overcome. Lamb is going to be victorious in this war. You, you think about, again, this idea of this great, nasty beast against a lamb. You would naturally expect the beast would be victorious, but he's saying the lamb is going to be victorious over this beast, including those ten horns or ten kings. So ten horns or ten kings or lesser kings. So it talks about the heads, thinking about Roman rule, Roman emperors, and then these ten kings who receive power, who have bowed down to, have committed fornication with the beast, the harlot. And what's going to, what are those going to do? Verse 16. What are they going to do? Verse 16. What's that? They're going to turn on her. Why? Because all of a sudden they become noble and good and said, We don't. Verse 17 defies that God says he will put it in their hearts. Mm -hmm. That they'll turn against her. Okay, now practically in history, how this unfolded was of course Rome grew weaker and weaker more corrupt internally it was it was caving in and then these outside forces came in and overtook the former empire 
you know, brought Rome down, so these ten lesser kings. But what I want us to understand here is they're not doing it for noble purposes. They're doing it for their own selfish purposes. It's, to me, it's kind of like Amnon and Tamar. Remember, Amnon just, he could not stand it until he had Tamar. And then after he had Tamar, what does the Bible say about him? Despised Yeah, he hated her. He hated her with more hatred than what he had loved her with, with love. So that object that is so desired that once it's had, then you hate the object. Not that you've given up the, in this case, lust, materialism, things like that. That's not it. Just the object of it is what you hate and despise now. So that's what's happening with these ten kings. Now, question number two I had asked to define and explain what it means to be called, chosen, and faithful. What's the idea? Well, in Acts uh, chapter 2 and verse 39, it says, For the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call. Okay. So God has set forth His calling through the gospel, and it is not only to those of which this was written in the book of Acts or those that were there at the Revelation letter, but to all that are far off until the end of time. God's call is set forth. Yes, that call through the gospel. They've been called by the word of God, and they are chosen how? How's that chosen work? When they respond to the gospel. When they respond to the gospel, right. Because the gospel sets out standards and say, here's the people I'm looking for. If you meet that standard, you're the one I want. You're the one I've been looking for. So they've been chosen in that sense. And faithful, what about that? Called by the gospel, chosen, because they've accepted it, they've submitted to it. And faithful. Maybe we don't need to elaborate, but humor me. Reverse to those who stick with it and follow what they learn about it and accept them and then move on. Right. What's, what's this whole letter about? To the end. To death. To death. To a murderous, torturous death. Stay faithful. Hang in there. So you got this great war with the beast and all the ferocious things that are associated with that beast. And he says, the lamb's going to win and those who are with him, those who are called, chosen, and faithful. So if you've not responded to the gospel or you've not been faithful, where do you end up in this picture? You end up on the side of defeat instead of the side of victory. And so he's, he's reminding them here, be faithful. It's terrible what you're facing, but be faithful because you will win in the end. All right, so rounding out that section, verse 18, he says he saw this great city. What kind of city was it? Reigns over the kings of the earth. So, what in the in anything written in the first century Mediterranean world, what city does that refer to? Can only refer to Rome, right? There again, there are some people who look at the Book of Revelation referring to the destruction of Jerusalem. It just doesn't fit. Jerusalem didn't have power and reign over the kings of the earth. They they were essentially considered kind of a backwater in the Roman Empire. Here, though, you understand when he talks about this great city, he's talking about that city of Rome. All right, anything else in chapter 17 before we plow into 18? All right, let's jump into 18. Let's read 1 through 8, please. Revelation 18, 1 through 8. He'll grab that mic. <clears throat> After these things, I saw another creature coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons 
and a prison of every unclean spirit, and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back even as she has paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds. And the couple she has mixed, mixed twice as much for her. To the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree give her tor torment, torment, and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I am not a widow, and I will never see mourning. For this reason, in one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire. For the Lord God who judges her is strong. Okay. So Babylon will be punished according to her sins. In verse 2, when he's crying out, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, what... What's he saying in there? I know that he's going to be defeated, but maybe there's a, a nuance or a specific idea there. Just me, Aaron, but I always thought that, you know, the Roman Republic initially was actually okay. Mm -hmm. You know, but through time, it became even more and more decadent, you know, to the point where it just became uh, just a filth. Uh, you know, I mean, it was uh, originally, it was a. Uh, it was, it was more of a country uh, family back home, farmer soldier you know, thing, and it went downhill from there. So, and he's talking about the decadence of it, how it became to the dwelling, it just, it just filled. Yeah, he, he definitely describes, you know, it's it's become full of, uh, you know, every foul spirit, the demons, and unclean and hated bird. It's a cage for it. It's just everything bad is here now. So yeah, over this time, it has totally become corrupt. Do you have something, Nancy? So Babylon is fallen. What, what was the state of Rome at the time this letter was written? Yeah, pretty much at the peak of its power at this time, if not shortly after this. But he's saying it is a foregone conclusion that it's done. Babylon is fallen. Now, question number three, I had asked, what does it mean that the kings of the earth committed fornication with the harlot? Verse three. They've accepted the Roman pagan beliefs and the emperor worship. So all of that corruption, um, spiritually, they had brought upon themselves. Why would they do that? Why would they accept to be in good favor, for one, and to fulfill their own lusts of participation in these things? Right. So if if Rome came into your territory and basically conquered you, you you had one of two choices. You you could either resist, and the more you resisted, the more determined they were to crush you. And you can go back and read accounts of this even in battles. If, if they came up to a, a, a city and that city put up its defenses and Rome had to really expend a lot of resources and especially soldiers to take that city, the city was pretty well doomed. They would go in and if they didn't slaughter all the people, they would go in and take them and they would sell them as slaves. And there are times they would sell 30,000 people as slaves. You're done for. But if they came up to your city and said, hey, you let us in? You know what? We'll, we'll let you keep going as you are. You're just now under our rule. You pay us our taxes. You, you provide soldiers for our armies. You help us out. Everything will be good. And they may even get a favorable trade deal and be able to ship stuff off and make money and all of that. And so there were a lot of them that said, that's what I want to do. Because Rome was viewed as invincible. And they were extremely brutal at times. And so these men were willing to 
commit fornication with Rome because of the goodies, of the favor, the, the material benefits that they would get out of that, and even the political power that they would gain out of that because Rome would be on their side then and that enemy next door, hey, let's go crush them. Mike? Yeah, you look at all the, what you just described with the nation of Israel, its leaders, and how it had kind of capitulated to this also. So they're, they're far off of this. Yes, yes, they most definitely are. They had committed fornication with Rome. You think about specifically the Sadducees, but the Herodians were definitely on Rome's side of things. Kind of to backtrack just a little bit mm -hmm. about the nuance about Babylon, mm -hmm. is when I think about America, just because as a nation we don't see that the, that the judgment has been pronounced, doesn't mean that it hasn't already been pronounced. Yes, exactly. We're going to circle back to that. My mind is right. No, no, perfect. It's per perfect, perfect. Perfect point right they there. They didn't know it. Babylon didn't know it, but they had already they, judged. Yes, exactly. Ron. I was just going to say, we're seeing that same thing in the Middle East with people and their allegiance uh, in those impoverished nations where the Taliban or whoever come in at war, if it's <laughs> European or U.S. forces, they're allegiant to whoever is there at the time. Like you're saying. Who's got the money? Who's got the bullets? Yeah, who's feeding me? I'm on that side. And somebody else comes in. Well, I'm on your side now. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's, the, that's the nature of man. I mean, is it the poison of every major world power that's coming in and taking over? I mean, even like Charlemagne, he went in and he started like getting a Christian. Or you got I mean, that's the way things are. And even like when World War II was over, we sent all our missionaries yes yes they do part of it is to um, assimilate them into your culture part of that assimilation is the religious side which is talking about that emperor cult and all through this book is really the idea of you want to be a loyal roman we want you to fit in you need to go along with us on this. So exactly right. It is it is a repeated pattern through history. And I thought I saw another hand. So I was just going to ask you in verse 17 of the previous chapter where it says God put it into their hearts. Could it be just even this nature that is what is in the heart of man unless we counter that nature to yield to these very things that you're describing? Yes, it can be that. It can be God's providence. You think about that he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, how did he harden Pharaoh's heart? Is with that declaration of truth that was given to him. And he, he stood up against that. Um, here are these things unfolding. They, they, they want what they want. They desire it. And when Rome can no longer provide that, they turn against her. And, and uh, as it said there, they, they burn her fire the ones who were in bed with her. Was there a hand back here? All right, so question number four I had asked, what are the people of God to do and why in verse four, Revelation 18, four? So if, if this place has demons and every foul spirit and all that going on, verse four, what does he tell the people of God to do? Come out. I was just going to say that he's telling them, you know, to separate themselves, to come out, and not to be partakers of, of this sin and of this iniquity that is being identified for them. Exactly. Um, is he telling them that they need to leave the city of Rome or that they would need to leave which this letter is written to the seven churches of Asia. Is, is he saying, you need to leave Asia? You need to leave Smyrna. You need to leave Ephesus. You need to get out of that. And, and you, need to go, you need to go to China. Or you need to go down into Africa. It would have been impossible. I mean, Rome was the known world. I mean, if you were going into those places, I was just thinking exactly what you're saying. I don't even know that they really even... What was it? There was nowhere to go. You know, I mean, you went to Africa, what are we going to do? 
is Is, is he telling them you need, to, you need to go out in the countryside and live in a cave? Mike? Well, I believe that uh, Paul answers that in 2 Corinthians. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Go. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and will walk among them and be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. And I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you. You shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord God Almighty. So he uses that word in 17. Therefore, what he's talking about is you cannot partake of uh, those idols and those things whenever you are the temple of God. Now, I'm talking about a physical place you can go, but you have to separate yourselves out of that sin. Okay. What did Jesus pray for the disciples? Keep them from the evil one. But what? Do what? You, they can't go out of the world. We can't. You know, sometimes we get these ideas, and I, I fantasize about this as well. Couldn't we just take a group of Christians and go off like to Montana and have our own little town and, you know, just not deal with all of this? Is that what the Lord wants? Andrew. I can't remember exactly where this Paul makes the question. Paul brings the point up when they're talking about um, the sin in the church and I'm just separated. And he's like, I'm not talking about the people in the world. Otherwise, we'd have to leave the planet. It's impossible. Right, yeah, 1 no Corinthians chapter 5. No mm -hmm. you go, the more you will be able to get away from it. You, can, you can't. You can't. Because. I hate to pop everyone's bubble, but there's sin among Christians. <laughs> if we went off into our little group, we, we would have issues too. We better be together fighting against the world than all alone fighting against each other. It, it actually does help our focus. But anyway, he's talking about you cannot be pulled into this filth, this abomination, this immorality, you have to stay separate from that. No matter how great the pressure is, the allurement, you have to be separate from that. And he's, he will be a father to them, as Mike talked about in 2 Corinthians 6. Mike? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, I mean, we do have this romanticized idea that, you know, we kind of become our own little community and stuff like that. That is not the purpose of the church, though. The purpose of the church is to sound out the gospel for those who are in sin. You have to separate yourself from the sin and by your life and by your words, by your actions, that is how God's kingdom starts to grow. It does not grow by us becoming a community of our own and then shut down everyone else. Right, right, exactly right, right. In addition to that point that Mike's making, what we read in 2 Corinthians, Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 11 it says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Right, expose them. Bring that to light. Show people, here's right, here's wrong, here's what God calls on you to do. Exactly. That, that's the reason we're here. With a re to, to help others to come to the Lord and serve Him. So as he goes on here, it talks about verse 5, Her sins have reached to heaven. That's the idea that her, her cup of iniquity is full. Remember that in Abraham and Isaac and Jacob's time, that they all dwelt in the land of Canaan, but the Lord talked about that their cup of iniquity is not yet full. That wasn't until the children of Israel came out of Egypt that that land of Canaan had reached the point that God said, I'm judging them. I'm going to use Israel to go in there and drive them out. And they were supposed to get rid of the idolatry. So it was. that's how he sees Rome here. They're, they're at that point, that point of judgment, that point of it's time to, to bring them down. And that, of course, unfolds. Now, question number five was... What is the principle found in verses 6 and 7? How does it apply in our lives? <coughs> Render to her just as what? 
She rendered to you. What's another way to put that? What's our Carmen, Carmen, common language? Well, it could be eye for eye, but there's something else. It's talking, at least as I see this, the, the relationship between rewards and judgment. You receive the things that you have done, the rewards that we're going to have, whether they're good or whether they're evil. You, you sow and you reap that principle, and then judgment is going to come. And he's declaring that. Judgment came upon Rome, judgment's going to come upon Paul. Yes. Sowing and reaping, sowing and reaping. It's, it's what do we normally call it? Uh, it's the blank of sowing and reaping. What do you call it? It's the blank of sowing and reaping. The law. Not, not the theory of sowing and reaping. It's the law. It is going to happen. Yeah, I think our common deity will be is what goes around comes around. That's it. Right. Exactly. So she's been sowing this persecution, shedding the blood of the saints, and what's he going to make her do? Essentially receive double. Receive double. Exactly right. It's going to come down on her like a ton of bricks, if you will. You know, if we live in sin, we receive the consequences. If our nation accepts sin, Nancy, what happens? Oh, well, it's, it's already been judged. Okay, it has been judged. Um, what, what was the harlot's view, verse 7? <coughs> Self-deception. She yeah. glorified herself. Nothing's ever going to happen to me. I am great and wonderful and Nothing's ever going to bring me down. A sit as queen will not see sorrow. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day. Death, mourning, famine. Um, okay. For anybody who may not know it, or you've missed it at some point, I love the United States of America. I love my country. I served in the military four years. Today, today, if I was called on, I would take up arms and defend it. I wouldn't give a second thought about my life. But our country is corrupt. It is immoral. The principles which it was founded upon have been dismissed, perverted, maligned now in our time. Um, and we have generally as an idea, well, no one will ever take the United States down. That is a foolish position. You know, Rome thought, citizens of Rome, the leaders of Rome, the legions of Rome, their viewpoint was, we'll never be defeated. And they were crushed. They were crushed so bad that the city of Rome, for, until about 150 years ago, the only thing it controlled was a small strip of Italy. I mean, even the U.S. Army has conquered Rome in the last 2,000 years. Right, right. So, you think about that. You know, in modern America, We've got the plague of alcohol and drugs and abortion and evolution and divorce and materialism and the destruction of the family with feminism and this whole gender, whatever you call it, all of that going on. It's judgment day is coming. Rome was cut out from the family, basically. I mean, it got so ridiculous. And I'm just, I know this was way before they, they actually went crazy, but I mean, they were, there was a guy liking that horse in the center. Okay? And, well, and, and I know he was nuts, but I'm just saying, you know, I'm sure there was people that agree with that too, you know, back then. 
Well, and they, they married. I, I forget which emperor it was, married a horse. So. Okay, you just think about that. That's happening in our nation. By the way, if you don't know that, people are marrying animals. I was going to say that this principle of a mighty nation not actually being taken out by uh, an external source, we can see that when we were Balak across Balaam and said, what am I right. going to do with this? Right. And he said, if you introduce sin into the system, that's what will bring the nation down. And that, that principle continues to play out for every single one we read of that no longer exists now. And we're all at the time every nation that comes along, when you introduce uh, sin into that system and it's taken hold on, it is like a cancer that is. And the, the proverb writer put it how? It's very succinct. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is reproached to many people. Exactly. That's that principle right there. Very good. Alright, so we're not going to read all of it just for the sake of time, but verses 9 through 20, you have two reactions to Babylon's fall. One of them is mourning. Who is it that's mourning over her, if you just take a peek there? Okay, merchants and kings. They stood at a distance and watched it because they didn't want to be a part of it. Um, why do the merchants weep? What's, what's bothering them? Safe. Safer trade. You can go from, you know, Spain all the way to part of the border without too much risk of getting involved. Right. Now Rome's safety's gone. Mm -hmm. The ability to bring stuff in from far away is gone. Their profit is gone. Exactly. Verse eleven, you know, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. The system collapsed, the economy collapsed. All that falls apart. The shipmasters, they have loss of wealth and trade, made desolate in one hour. It's a decisive and sure destruction of Rome that's taking place here. Um, question seven, who can rejoice at her fall? Verse 20 says, Apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Okay. God's people can rejoice. This isn't a, a rejoicing of vengeance. What type of rejoicing is it? Freedom? Freedom from that persecution? Anything else? Justice. Justice, Justice has been served. Do, don't we all look at injustice in our society and just wish that it would be set right? But we have very little power to bring that about. But one day it's going to be brought about. Everyone will face a day of reckoning. All those who have been involved in that corruption. So then, let's read verses 21 through 24, please. We'll wrap this up. 21 to 24, who will get that for us? Thank you. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus will, thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you any more. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you any more. The sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you any more. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you any more. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints of all who were slain on the earth. Okay. So picturing that utter destruction of Rome, thrown down like a millstone. What does a millstone do when it's thrown into the ocean? Just right. I mean, there's it's so that's what he says is that's what it's going to be like with Rome. It's just going to sink down. Now, couple things. One is let's understand that the fall of Rome was not simply 
Oh, the circumstances of history. It was God. God brought Rome down. You know, historians will go back and they'll say, well, there was this economic thing, here was this famine, they, they lost this over here, that over there. Okay, I get it. All those things, you know, happen. But why? It wasn't just happenstance. It was God bringing them down. God raises nations up and He brings nations down. Raises up kings and He brings them down. It's still true today. God raises up nations and He brings them down. Mike? Yeah, all of those things, those, those things that they say brought them down just out of the happenstance, all of them came at the exact same time, just like the Scripture said they would. She is drinking the things that she has, or she is reaping what she has sown. Right. And it talks about, you know, no more is going to be heard the harpist, the musician, the flutist, the bride, the bridegroom, all those kinds of things. And someone may be tempted to look at that and say, well, they have weddings in Rome today. Is the Rome today the Rome of the first century? No. That's just like people trying to say, well, Israel reestablished itself. No, it didn't. That's a completely different animal over there than what existed in ancient times. There is no Israel. There may be a, a political state that we call Israel, but it's not what you read about in the Bible. Um, and then here's the, the other thing I want us to think about. Um, if we want our nation to survive, what's the very best thing we can do? Be righteous. Be righteous. Pray. Pray. Confront the error and the wickedness that is about us. Confront it to the end of doing what? Preaching the gospel. Converting people, right? Bringing people in. It's, okay, it's not politics. Sometimes we get distracted, and I'm not saying don't vote, I'm not saying don't donate to a candidate, or support a candidate, or whatever it may be. That's all fine, well, and good, but that's not going to save our nation. The only thing that can save our nation is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Winning the hearts and minds of men and women that they would live righteously because righteousness exalts a nation. Not politics, not a political party, not a particular person in office, although all that may be in the providence of God, but righteousness is what we need. So we come out from among the iniquity and we help others to come out, that's what will preserve us. That's what will, will extend our life for another generation and be a blessing to those who are to come. So let's focus on that and putting our faith in God. All right, any other thoughts before we close out? Ron. That points you know, that's, you know, what Paul wrote to Romans about not be not conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that all of this is taking place in the minds of men. Exactly. The battle's right here. Right there in the mind. All right, thank you all very much. Uh, Lord willing, we'll continue on next week.